Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Healthcare Experience Matters. Today's episode is a recorded webinar that has been edited and condensed for a more friendly podcast listening experience. This webinar is entitled More COVID, More Than I Can Take, Finding Individual Strength in Our Collective Experience. It features speakers Kathleen Lynham and Katrina Coleman. For more information on upcoming webinars and events and resources from the Healthcare Experience Foundation, please visit healthcareexperience.org. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Owens with the Healthcare Experience Foundation. I'm really pleased to welcome you to our session today, More COVID, More Than I Can Take. And this topic is of such personal and professional importance to our team at Healthcare Experience Foundation and our partners, the Maryland Healthcare Education Institute. We're going to be focusing on finding individual strength in our collective experience. Um, So let me really get out of the way for our topic and welcome you again at Healthcare Experience Foundation. Our fundamental premise is that every person is worthy of an environment where they can both deliver and receive the best healthcare experience. And um, as a true partner in that journey, we have our speakers today Um, Kathleen Lynham from Healthcare Experience Foundation and our partner, um, the Maryland Healthcare Education Institute, and really honored to have Katrina Coleman join us. Um, We have together for the last, gosh, 18 months been collaborating with the workforce around the response to the COVID pandemic. Without any further ado, I'd love for Kathleen and Katrina to introduce themselves and, and welcome everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you today. Thank you, Ms. Katie. Hey, gang. Hi, it's Kathleen Lynham here. I am an executive coach with Healthcare Experience Foundation, spent 35 or 36 years in hospital operations. The last eight, I was a chief nursing officer. And the last 12, I've been very, very privileged to work as an executive coach with Katie and others in a lot of different capacities around the country. But I'm very delighted to have my colleague here, Ms. Katrina Coleman, and ask her to introduce herself. Thanks, Kathleen. I am Katrina Coleman with the Maryland Healthcare Education Institute. My background, like Kathleen's, is in nursing. However, it took a little different path. Um, I was that curly-haired six-year-old girl that got the nurse's kit for Christmas, and that was it. So all I ever wanted to do and be was a nurse. Once I got my bachelor's degree and then my master's degree in nursing and moved into some of the roles that you fill, no matter if you're a nurse or in another healthcare discipline, when you move into that middle layer of leadership, Um, I soon discovered that what made me a great nurse and what would make me a great leader, two different skill sets. So I moved into leadership development in healthcare. My why before the pandemic was about you and helping you become better leaders in healthcare, no matter where you worked in the organization, formally as a leader or informally, it was about growing you as a leader. My why has changed throughout the pandemic. My why is to help grow your courageous confidence. That's enough about me. I'm going to turn it back over to Kathleen. As you hear, Katrina works in Maryland Health Education Institute, and I am working around the country with Katie and Healthcare Experience Foundation. And over the course of the last year, we are in coaching remotely, and we have been hearing, you know, directly from physicians, nurses, CEOs, leaders, all around the challenges that you're all facing. And so kind of on a lark, two weeks ago, we sent out a little thing. Maybe maybe this work that we've been doing on, on supporting you where you are would be of interest. And I think within whatever, three days, we had 100 people signed up for this webinar. So it kind of validates that we all need to be validated in what you're experiencing. And I think people, and we read some of your um, comments in when you signed up here, a lot of you are doing well and in leadership positions, but worried and concerned about the people you work with, your staff, your team, and rightly so. So we have three simple um, objectives. We want to validate emotions that you're likely experiencing. Um, I tell everyone, besides being raised by wolves, because I was an orthopedic nurse. So that's one way I say it. My, my orthopedic surgeons are a tough group. I've also been tempered, if you will, by social workers. I've been raised by my daughters, a social worker, every one of my sister-in-laws, my dearest friends. 
And they've always taught me, Kath, you nurses, you rush into things. The first thing we you always want to solve problems. The first thing we need to do is validate and acknowledge where people are and normalize it for them. So it's good words of advice for all of us that are used to action oriented. We want to help you validate emotions. You are likely experiencing others. We want to define and do some self-assessment there for emotional exhaustion. There's a lot of terms out there, emotional exhaustion, compassion, fatigue, burnout. You know, what's the commonality and, you know, what do we need to do to mitigate that right now during this challenging time? And then, yes, we are going to hopefully share some strategies that will work for you individually and help restore personal and team morale. So uh, in the past five days, have you experienced, are you confident, exhausted, suspicious, ecstatic, frightened, happy, disappointed, embarrassed, frustrated? Any of all, what about your staff and the people you work with? Have you seen those faces everywhere? Where do you fall most days? Are you feeling positive and um, optimistic when we do this? Or are you more like, oh my gosh, I'm just not sure I can carry on each day. You know, whatever it is that you're experiencing and that your team and staff are experiencing, the most important thing to know is you are not alone even though it may feel that way. As I said, we're in contact with people all over the, the country, but also globally. Um, we you know, do a lot of research in our role. We're allowed to, we're, you, know, you don't have the time. So we're out there researching the latest and the, and the trends and the strategies and, the, and all of the articles. And guess what? Around the world, peers in Europe, in China, in England, in Italy, everyone are feeling the stress and the stretch. And those feelings are being demonstrated in different ways. It sort of broke my heart to see, and yet I, I appreciate it. I'm not, I'm not judging it, that the headlines and the news nightly are about, you know, emotional pleas of our COVID ICU nurses down in Florida. Brian and I think Ohio or, or in the Midwest, frustrated, exhausted over latest COVID-19 surge. And, you know, we read this article the other day, what COVID nurses want you to know right now about what we can do to help them. And the feelings of frustrated, dumbfounded, exhausted come over and over and over again. And where do you fit in all that? Oh, my gosh, Kathleen. And so in the midst of all of this, you are participants in this webinar. You as a healthcare leader or healthcare team member, you are smack dab in the middle of it all. Because when you leave your family and you go to work as a healthcare team member or leader, you become part of a collective group, otherwise known as the essential employee. So not only are you in this elite group of an essential employee, lay on top of that, the global pandemic that has rocked our worlds, disrupted so many parts of our lives, then lay on that what some economists are calling the year of the great resignation. 2021 is being known as the year of the great resignation, not just in healthcare, but in other workforces as well. Those things, among other things that are happening in our world, lead to those unprecedented pressures facing you and your teams. Do you remember, oh my gosh, 2.7 2.7 million healthcare workers. Let me say that number again. 2.7 million healthcare workers plan to exit, leave healthcare once this pandemic is over, or as we're seeing the end of the pandemic. On top of that, 60% of leaders in healthcare are reporting they feel used up at the end of the day. I feel used up at the end of that day. Out of that 60, of those who feel used up, they're expected to change organizations. Look at that loss. Look at the loss of knowledge, competency, history, let alone those physical bodies filling those roles. And as we were leading, some of us, we were leading teams in the virtual world, only 20% of leaders surveyed felt they were being effective. Uh, That means 80% weren't. Think about those numbers. Take a pause. 2.7 million healthcare workers planning to leave. 60% of leaders feeling used up. 40% of those wanting to leave the organization. And such a small number feeling effective. Do you remember back in the beginning of the pandemic? March, I'll take you back. March 2020. 
we were told we're going to close schools for two weeks. Then it was summer, summer, the heat, it's coming, it's going to go away, this virus, this pandemic. Oh, we're not going to shut anybody down. We're not going to have to wear masks everywhere. Oh, here's the vaccine. It's going to be good. Then we have variants. We have surges. We have the fear of the vaccine. Sometimes this feels like forever. Is this road ever going to end? It can feel like it is just forever. So some things are feeling a little out of control. We are exhausted physically and emotionally, sometimes from just donning and doffing the PPE all day long. The staffing shortages, when we go into work and there are holes in in the staffing, we struggle. We struggle as leaders knowing how to support our teams. We struggle as healthcare workers knowing how to support each other when there are times that we can't even provide a decent meal break, let alone give two or three days off just to rejuvenate and restore. And I don't know about you, but I'd like a little magic in this world. Can we get it, Kathleen? Wouldn't we all love a little magic? I could give you 10,000 nurses that are appear that are ready to work tomorrow, or um, maybe you need another 500 beds here, or you need the equipment, or you need the the energy and the excitement, and you need all of that to rejuvenate you. I'd like to look into this crystal ball and tell you soon, my friend, it's going to be over soon, but we don't have any of the answers to any of that. And on top of all that, there's one other thing that we really felt that kind of compelled us in these conversations that we've had with our, with, you know, healthcare executives around the country with teams that we're working with South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, New Jersey, Maryland. What's come up out of magic? We talk about the how did that elephant in the room that nobody talks about? I don't know about you, but have you noticed, I don't know, a lack of patience, kindness, gentleness? Did I mention patience? <laughs> um, around everywhere in the car, in the store, you know, that Katrina said, we don't have enough workers anywhere. You ever wait in your restaurant? And we were in a restaurant in, um, in North Carolina the other night, like two and a half hours. Our little waitress was beside herself. She tried her best to come back. She was ready to go. And we're like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But we could see other people were not as kind and gentle. And so this anger, this rudeness, This, if you will, angry, impatient, rude, and even provocative individuals, I bet every one of you are facing that. And and perhaps some of your staff are like that on a daily basis. And I want to remind us about being mindful to use your pause. I'm assuming that, you know, here in 2021, you've all had some education foundation and emotional intelligence and and recognizing an amygdala hijack. And when you see red, you want to react and spout off anything. Well, we all know from the science, neuroscience and stuff, we have an opportunity to pause before we let go. Um, And I want you to think about perhaps the, the, the last person that you kind of pushed your buttons and put you over the edge. You know, what first thing that comes to mind, if we're judging someone about taking a vaccine or not taking a vaccine, Mm -hmm. how do we stop that judgment and move to a different focus in our mind. And there's lots of things. That's a choice. Is there something that I need to say? What about empathy? Is that what is the other person's point of view? Compassion, what can I do or say to demonstrate understanding? And ensuring, again, as leaders, did I actively listen? Did I give that other person a chance to explain or apologize? Will this embarrass the person? Is there a better way or time to say it? Are my words respectful? How would I feel if someone said this to me? And I love, there's a great book out. Of course, I never get names accurate, but Katie will correct me at the end. I think it's called The Question Mark. And it's it's wonderful. It talks about, am I judging where I become angry or defensive? Can I turn that into being curious? And there's a famous little tip that I love that I write down and remember all the time. If they are furious, then be curious. 
instead of matching emotion to emotion, which we can't do as leaders, because really our job as leaders is to what? Is to influence others, to be role models. And if we're reactionary, that is not going to help anyone. So if they're if I'm they're furious, how can I be curious and find out more? And so some of that reframing exercises that we just you know, thought you might be facing, we thought we'd give you some little tips or just some things to remind you. You know, if people are uncertain and frazzled, I can listen, I can be empathic and demonstrate understanding, even if I cannot fix it. That's really important for people to know. We're going to find a little later on that two of the things that are really driving the burnout is not reminding, having a sense of purpose and meaning. And the second part is not getting that emotional support acknowledge where people are and be present to them, even if you cannot fix it. The second thing, you know, if this has been the hardest year ever, you know, it's not that you want to say, no, it hasn't, but, you know, at the right time, yeah, it has been, but look at how we have grown as a team. I've heard that over and over again, people that have worked together, there's such utmost respect and appreciation for the team that they work together and they're better. They can almost read each other when it's about, this is just too much. Turning that for yourself into, you know what? I am resilient. I am strong and courageous. We all are. How can we help ourselves there? Everything is changing. It feels out of control. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. We can choose to focus on what we can control and always, always look for the learning. And I like this one. I wish things could go back to normal. But the truth of the matter is, you know, it was normal when I was a nurse back in 1974, 1975. Was it normal 1990? And was it ever really working? What can we learn to rebuild and be stronger and better? We've got to practice as leaders self-compassion. I'm doing my best. I'm going to choose to bring my very best to every encounter. Those are some of the ways that we can practice, utilize not only emotional intelligence, but mindfulness. And there are reframing exercises I can use as a healthcare leader or team member for the folks that I'm working with when they talk about this has been the hardest year and validating that, saying, oh my God, yes, it has. Don't say the word, but put a period. And however, what are some things I know I've grown as a nurse, as a respiratory therapist, as a registrar, whatever that is, helping people see that they've grown, that they're resilient, that they're courageous, helping others to reframe. Well, we've also had some comments in the chat, um, Kathleen, about we've got some folks that on top of it, put on some of the natural disasters that are happening with the hurricane and Hurricane Ida. Oh my gosh, can Mississippi, can Louisiana, can they be hit with one more thing? And that there's just so much on us that's leading to that stress and burnout that Kathleen's talking about. I was going to say the same thing. I remembered now that we had Louisiana, Mississippi, people who are, have been devastated by Katrina before and how we could, how you've grown in, from the past. I bet many of you were there or perhaps have learned from it. And I'm going to talk a little bit later at the end about, you know, planning for the future and recognizing the strength. And I, you know, I know here um, the uh, challenges all of us are facing and you're right, uh, the natural disasters and the unnatural disasters and living and surviving through them have to build a certain resilience or a certain weariness. So now you take that from there, Ms. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathleen. And Heather's right. Heather put into chat, she um, must work in infection control. She's like the upside or silver lining is people know who and what infection preventatives are, our infection control practitioners are and what they do. The downside is sometimes there's times Heather's like, can I just go unnoticed? Like, oh my gosh, really? Right. So in addition to some of the things that we've talked about, we would love to hear from you. Put into chat, have you been feeling any of these emotions, being numb, frustrated, sad, depressed, anxious, tired, worried? And just so you know, these emotions can really mask anger. Give some reflection to what you're feeling and think about, is there something underneath that? And what you may find is, it really is anger. Like, oh my gosh, seriously? Now we have a hurricane on top of everything? Really? Can't they just get vaccinated? Oh my gosh, another variant? Are you, wait, they're changing their minds on boosters. What? All of them. You guys are seeing so much in that chat. Thank you. Thank and you. I wonder, I wonder, are they reflecting what they're feeling and what they're also seeing their staff and peers? Because it's got to be a challenge when I'm 
I'm being, I'm doing my best to be optimistic and, and hopeful and courageous. And I'm surrounded by Debbie Downer or, or, you know, malicious Mark, or I'm sorry, I'm making up these stupid names, but you know, the, the person that, you know, the caves, the citizens against virtually everything that just no matter what you do kind of bring you down. That's also very, very challenging there. I bet. I love that. Oh my, yeah. So we were talking about ourselves, but your team as well. And so one of the things that we want you to recognize, and we want you to help your team and your peers recognize that no matter what you're feeling, what your peers are feeling, man, you are not alone. So one of the things that we need to do for each other is to validate that folks are not alone. It's almost like normalizing that in the, in the given circumstances, this is absolutely right what you're feeling. It's understandable. So what are some of those symptoms of emotional exhaustion, compassion fatigue, burnout? Compassion fatigue and burnout, they are prevalent in healthcare. However, they're really seen a lot in nursing, that compassion fatigue and burnout. And that is highly detrimental if I'm a nurse that compassion and fatigue and burnout, that's highly detrimental to my professional quality of life. And that stress and burnout can lead to that great resignation. Um, one of the things that it's hard to differentiate sometimes between emotional exhaustion, compassion, fatigue, and burnout. So let's look at these. Um, that emotional exhaustion that's a term that we use to describe chronic, the effects of chronic stress. Those effects can vary from person to person. Um, typically, it comes on over a longer period of time than compassion fatigue. And emotional exhaustion affects us physically, emotionally, behaviorally. And then the combination of all of those three things, that really distresses us. So one of the things about emotional exhaustion is don't forget, it is not permanent. Sometimes when people are sitting in that world of being emotionally exhausted, they think they're always going to sit there. It's not permanent. Look at compassion fatigue and burnout, what we have on the slide. There's not a real, sometimes a real clear definition of the differences of the two. You'll see some similarities as you're walking through, and you also see some differences. Compassion fatigue, that term was first coined to describe a healthcare worker who's disconnected from patients and families, who depersonalizes the patient and the family and the care. It is usually associated with some sort of trauma, where burnout, again, is that chronic workplace stress, typically not trauma-related. And it's Chronic workplace stress that is not managed well, we don't handle it well. So we know that you're hearing those terms of compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Know they're a little similar, and yet they're different. And know that these two things, this is what is leading to the majority of folks leaving healthcare. This is what's leading to that great resignation of 2021. So how do we survive right now? What do we do? You guys, Kathleen talked about, you put into chat, people are short-tempered, impatient, if I can say mm, just a little snarky. So what we've wanted to do in this first piece of the webinar is to help validate that what you're feeling and your team is feeling, it's real. It is real. However, we're just not going to sit here and validate. We're also going to talk about now, what do we do? Because we are healthcare workers and we all want to help each other. So Kathleen, what do we do with all this? Oh, it's magic. This is where the magic show is. Yes. On this little Lisa Oliveira thing, I just, the be gentle with yourself. I think, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with physician and residents and about self-compassion. And, and we have recognized that we in healthcare do not do a good job with treating ourselves with compassion. And we really need to, you know, make sure that we're not so hard on ourselves and do other things, which we'll talk about a little later to do. So what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do as an executive coach that's been traveling for 12 years up until albeit two years ago is, and I could give the speech right away, the safety speech, put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. We need to take care of ourselves and ensure that we're okay first. The second thing, I want you to get your mirror out. 
Katrina was talking about that leaders and your role. And we have been coaching around the country for many years now. And so many times executive team will say, when are they going to improve the patient satisfaction? Or when are we going to see employee engagement get up? And I typically will bring, any of you have heard me speak before at conferences, I bring my mirror with me. And the first thing I say is look in the mirror. How easy is it for you to change? The first thing that we have to realize before anything else changes, anything else changes, we have to change you yourself, I myself. So I want you to be writing down what can you stop doing? What can you continue doing? And what can you start doing? And the fourth thing is what can you share with someone else to help them move along? Because our job as leaders is to influence and help others and move forward. So get your mirror out and get your pens out. The first thing we have to remember is as a leader, what can I control? So you have to focus on all of those things. And that is about choosing a positive attitude. It is about turning off the news. It's about finding purpose. And let me assure you, when you find your purpose every day and you live in a purposeful life and make sure you're sharing that, that ripple effect will have that on others. We want to be around people that have that energy and that have that validation and finding purpose is so important. Katrina shared her purposes to help leaders. Mine is a little bit more basic is I want to be a mirror. I want to be a reflection for people. I want to be God's mirror for somebody and show them what good they have and reflect the gifts that they have. We don't spend enough time recognizing our gifts. So I can, I focus on who can I validate and, and lift up and let them know what a great job they're doing and what gifts they have. Finding things to do at home, your own social distancing. I can control my kindness and my grace and how I follow things. What I can't control is predicting what will happen, if others will follow, the social media posts of others, how long this will last, the amount of supplies, how others react or others' behaviors. Probably the hardest thing I've had to learn in 26, lovely, sorry, honey, 27 years of marriage, however many years, is he's not going to change. <laughs> He tries, but it's up to me. If something is ticking me off, I've got to learn how I can deal with things differently. And so I want you to think about in those top three things that challenges that you're thinking about right now, whether it's people, whether it's situations, um, is there something you can stop doing? Is there something you can start doing? And now that you've got your oxygen and we're thinking about what I can control, I love this. Go back to Mr. Rogers. When I was a boy and I would see a scary thing in the news, my mom would tell me, look for your helpers. They will always find people who are ready to help. All of us have to acknowledge who are our helpers, who helps, who helps us with grace every day, who helps us at work. Are we thanking them? Are we letting them know you're my helper? Thank goodness you're here. And can those helpers help us with those challenges that you're facing right now with whatever it is, whether it's recruiting, whether it's in maintaining a positive courageous approach, even though you're worried to death about how are we going to get through next week, find your helpers and work with them. And, you know, as we talk about this great resignations, it's not like organizations haven't tried. Um, we've been doing a lot of coaching in the last couple months, I guess, with an executive team on engagement with their physicians and their nursing staff. And we found that those that did better, it wasn't because they had filled more vacancies, it's because they did a better job of communicating what they're doing about recruiting. They're out there consistently. They've got elevator speech. They've got messages about here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. So we know that organizations have tried to encourage more frequent breaks when they can, you know, to reduce those meeting times, to provide holidays, vacation time when you're able. And we know that that's a challenge. We're bringing up food and recognition and all of that are wonderful, meaningful things. Hopefully everyone on this call. And I'd love for you to put this in the chat because this would be interesting for me as a former chief nurse officer to understand and as an executive coach, are you seeing more visibility from your executive team or less? Because we know, I know as a former, like I said, CNO and as an executive coach, that oftentimes the mentality is, oh my gosh, they're busy in the ER. They're crazy. I don't want to go down and add to that. That is so wrong. 
if they're busy in that ER or they're going crazy in that step down ICU, get your buns over there and let them know, I see what you're doing. Thanks for, thanks for what you're doing. How can I help you? Time and time again, staff, even if you're not able to help them get them a cup of coffee or recognize sending a note later, that visibility matters now more than ever. And sadly, we've heard in the beginning of COVID, executives were present, making rounds, telling you this, telling you that. And we've seen a, a, a wavering in that. So I'd love for you to add into your chat, we see more of our leadership team or less because the recruiting is happening everywhere, but we're not, we're all, we're all basically competing for the same travelers, for the same nurses, for the same thing. And we've been providing, many organizations have been providing resiliency series, but that's still not enough, right? Why isn't that enough? And the truth of the matter is because we go back to those elements of emotional exhaustion and compassion fatigue that lead to burnout, it's more than just they feel that they're that they're overextended. It's more than just overload in the job. It goes back to people need emotional support and they need to have that sense of meaning, what I'm doing. And that, my friends, is something every leader can do. Make sure you're connecting the dots about the purposeful, the meaning, the saving lives that they're doing on every day. What we can do is work on emotional support and making sure that we're uh, validating and recognizing. So we're going to give you now these seven steps that organizations can do to improve and mitigate. And it comes from this article about what you're getting wrong about burnout by this very cool woman, Liz Fossilane. I, I have her name in the back there. I, I'm killing her name, but... Um, she's an she's an expert in this, and their organization studies this. So these are seven different steps. Some will be a reminder. You might want to start doing them. You might want to stop doing them. You might want to continue doing them or add to them about that we can do to help mitigate and, and improve morale for our team and for organizations. And the keywords are acknowledge, reduce, create, stop, identify, facilitate, and keep. So Katrina, take us through the first thing. Absolutely. And before we jump into this, Kathleen, I'm going to go back to chat because we do have oh, some good. using that. Absolutely. Good. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, remember how we were talking about organizations are trying, they're doing different things. Some folks have put into chat what their organizations are doing. Uh, one hospital's increased pay for working on the COVID unit. Good. There's another um, another chat of it's coming up fast again, but their organization did resiliency training during the holidays for all of the team members. I know I can't believe it's coming up again. Yeah. Um, work counselors led those sessions. Oh my gosh, Miranda, they started at her organization, a positive palooza. Oh my gosh, I love that word, positive palooza, right. where the, leader, the leaders focused on sharing positives, recognizing publicly those things and the teams that have created a positive dis, uh, difference. I love that, yeah. positive palooza. Um, one person has shared the, our executive team is one woman, um, one woman, and she's awesome. And she's out and about all of the time. Good. All right, awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. So let's go back to what's one, what's the first thing when we talk about acknowledge with those seven steps. So it is about validating and acknowledging what people are going through emotionally. This is one idea that we're sharing. It's pick your color of the day or of the week, and you can do it on an individual basis, or you could do it as a team for the individual basis. Just as I would say to you right now, what would your color be? What would your color be if we asked you that? So it's about meeting people where they are. So we know if we've got someone who's red, that they say, you know, right now, today for me, I'm, a, I'm red. Then we know that we've got to do more frequent check-ins, connections, rounding on them, supporting them as a team. Sometimes we've got that yellow. We're just tired. Um, sometimes we've got the all good and that purple strong. So just some ideas. So we've got to help people meet, meet them where they are emotionally. And I'm going to throw out the terms moral injury. That's what I thought of when we had that previous slide on about coming back from work after vacations, mm -hmm. as well as pulling in to the, the parking lot. We're almost past burnout, moral injury, where we just hurt. We've seen so much. So after acknowledge, Kathleen, what do we do? 
Well, this is something that we can all perhaps stop. Or I look back on my days and think, oh my goodness, I remember as a CNO, I'd be working on the weekends and I'd send out emails on the weekend and I would send out a weekend and I thought, oh, I'm working, I'm keeping up with stuff. That only served to add unnecessary anxiety to my staff, my leaders, my directors and stuff. So sending an email at 6 p.m. on a Sunday or Sunday morning saying, let's talk, not a great idea. Scheduling unclear meetings, we need to talk without context and stuff, or I need to give you feedback from a family, see me when you can. All of that, um, sending a team or group reminder when only one or two individuals need feedback, that kind of stuff kind of put on your emotional intelligence before you send an email and think, well, this, if you will, use that and pause. Is this going to add anxiety to somebody? Is it necessary that I do that? Can I just wait till I talk to them in person? It's amazing what we who are in leadership positions can do to others. We can really cause more angst than is necessary. And our job is to try to reduce whatever we can. And perhaps the question goes down to ask them, am I doing anything that's making you more crazy? Is there other things? And we'll talk a little bit about that there. That's number two. Number three, Katrina? It's about setting goals and celebrating milestones. Um, Kathleen's mentioned earlier that people need to be connected to their why having that belief that they're making a difference. Our personal best looks different today than it did in September of 2019. Our definition of success is different today than it was prior to the pandemic. So talk to your team, talk to your staff, talk to your peers. What does success look like today, now, in the moment? Sometimes it's even as what does it look like in the next four hours, let alone a full day? So talk about the goals for the morning, the goals for the day, help people find their why, that they're making a difference, connecting to purpose. So talk about how success, what success looks like in the moment. Using, I'd love to know in the chat again, how many of you use morning or evening huddles to communicate those kind of things? Are you doing that now? Do you have any other ideas about your reflection for the day, the goal for the day, the finding, you know, your why and coming back and sharing someone. I found out why I was here today. It was for this patient or this family or for my peer. You know, that's part of, I taught a, I didn't teach, but I was part of a holistic uh, nursing course that we did 10 week course uh, a couple of years ago. And it's really important to get back and affirm and make sure we're all connecting to our why and recognizing that. So uh, I love those ideas. And Kathleen, Shelly already put into chat as part of neonatal nurses week. They ask the staff to tell them their why and remember why they became a NICU nurse in the first place and kind of go back to that. I love that folks did that. Some folks are having huddles where they look at at their why. Um, Some folks have a three-tiered huddle system. Um, The end of every staff huddle includes kudos, tons of kudos every day in all areas. Yeah. So folks are using huddles. Just as Kathleen said, make sure you're using that huddle to connect to why. And what does success look like? Good language. So this is, again, mine because I, again, reflecting back on my days, I was known as Bossy Boots. Um, I think it was affectionately, and I don't know if any of my uh, former colleagues are on this line there, but I was known as Bossy Boots. And apparently, I, if you can see me, what I did when I learned that I was a little too bossy, I have enough, hopefully, self-awareness and social awareness at the time that I remember saying to them, listen, if I am ever micromanaging or too controlling or too bossy, just give me the C. Give me the, just Kathleen, put the little C up like you're a control freak. And I'll tell you, it brought laughter. It made me laugh. It sort of helped diffuse my defense of, I am not being bossy to, oh, okay, maybe I am. But when we micromanage, we've got to figure out, there's usually three big things that are sort of influencing our ability to micromanage, our own insecurities, this is challenging times and we're all under the pressure to report to the board, report to this, you know, you're worried about your staffing and all, all of that kind of stuff. So our tendency is to perhaps get involved and not trust. And so we've got to, you know, if you will, let go and, and trust our staff and our leaders. And if they fail at something, you know, then how we manage that is really important and, and, and encourage them and lift them up. 
we have to let go of perfection. Now, I'm not talking about let's get sloppy and have meta errors and not be doing that stuff, but we have to go what our definition of perfection is and realize that others need to set the expectations and the standards and how we can do this in a healthy, safe, and quality method. And the third thing is we've got to remember to how are we, what are we doing instead of micromanaging to create a strong team dynamic? How are you supporting the we? the what a great team you are. How do you manage your team up? Do you welcome and say, this is Four East, it's the best floor uh, in this organization. We have the best team of nurses. We have the best team of clips. We're in cardiac rehab, we're in rehab. What are we doing to create a strong dynamic? As a leader, that's really important that we lift up and recognize that, and recognizing the different team members. We used to do that at Huddle too, and do a shout out. Who lifted me up today? Who did a great job? covering my my calls or or helping me with my call bells or doing my stuff. It's important that we encourage and support that and also role model that. Nice. So in addition to acknowledging where you and your staff are, avoiding um, creating unnecessary anxiety, setting those clear goals, expectations, connecting to why, not micromanaging, it's also about finding new learning opportunities. Um, When we can acquire, learn, and practice new skills, think about it for yourself. It helps us to recharge and manage that job-related stress. In the very recent weeks um, at GBMC, which is a hospital in the Baltimore area, um, there was a news article and interviews, and it caught our attention because of this. Not only Did they save someone's life after that person being clinically dead for 45 minutes? Read the quotes that are on the screen. Let me tell you a little bit about this circumstance. There was a mom at the hospital whose daughter was giving birth. She was soon going to be a grandmother and she collapsed in the waiting area. And by the time they got her to the ER, she had no vital signs. And they kept working and working and working in that ER to save her for 45 minutes. They were using a new technique with CPR that allows you to get feedback on things like the depth of the compressions, et cetera. And they, that woman survived and gave a news conference. She is whole and healthy and is a grandmother to this day. However, look at this quotes on the screen. This is from a physician who was on the resuscitation team. Amid that stressful time with COVID patients, fighting burnout, working long hours, few resources, the patient's name was Patton. Patton's survival story is exactly what we all needed. It gave us a much needed reset. It hit that reset button. We needed you. We needed your story. We needed you to come here. So helping folks learn different skills, ask, what do you want to learn? Where do you want to grow? Have the team members do like a skill swap where I'm going to take 15 minutes and teach somebody else something. So find new learning opportunities. They are right there in front of you throughout this past year. I love it. Yeah, I love that one too. That's a very good one. Mm -hmm. You know, research, has. there's been years and years of research on the most loyal and engaged employees. And that research interestingly shows that people who bowl together, who um, are in softball games, softball teams, uh, connecting outside of work and inside work. That's a really important thing. I remember years ago, Prescani, I don't know if they still ask it. Do you have a friend at work? Do you have a friend at work? I want to break into song. And that was a very a predictor of engagement and loyalty is if you had a best friend at work. So facilitate connections with your team in and outside of work. Um, my, my daughter uh, was telling me that they do a step challenge. You know, everybody's got a Fitbit. And so um, thinking about ideas and prizes for the daily winner who has the most steps or who did the most stairs this week and, and coming up with some fun recognition there. Who's working over the weekend could use a meal delivery, planning a potluck dinner or lunch during the day and having every or during the evening or during nights coming in, anything that you can do to promote and support. And and when I read this, I'm reminded of that article about what COVID nurses want you to know. And one of the things that really touched me was um, they feel, many feel forgotten by their community. You know, there was, God, I'm New York, New Jersey, and my friends in Holy Name Hospital in New York, where we were hammered the first, first couple of months. 
And the community was there delivering meals. The restaurants were delivering food in the parking lot. You could go, you know, get a dinner when you got off shift. Um, there were signs for stuff. That has all sort of faded a bit. And so I would encourage if there's executive team members on here, talk to your marketing, talk to your community people, talk to your churches, your whatever resources in the community and see what else we could re resurrect. You know, a lot of these people just having a meal for their kids for the weekend or a, um, you know, us, you know, getting a basket, raffling off a basket and giving a basket to one of your employees that has all of the, the treats, anything like that that we can do that you make sure you tell them about, let them know about what we're trying to do and ask their ideas would be, would be something I think that would be of great value. Absolutely, Kathleen. And we want to hear from you. What are some other ideas that your organization is doing to help build that team morale? Um, we want to hear in chat. So put it in chat so that we can share. We have somebody who put in about their CEO. And I love it that it's Words of Wisdom Wednesday. We're not rating till the end of the week, midweek. Here are some emails, quotes, memes that support the whole organization and reminds the organization of what's important in our lives, despite of what we're going through and what we do to survive patient care during the pandemic. I love that. Be thinking, and this this isn't doesn't all fall on leaders. If you are a leader, are you rounding? Are you asking what's brought you joy? Where are you finding hope? How are you connecting to your why? As peers, be thinking about what we do for each other. I have 10 minutes. Is What can I go do for you? Or I've got downtime if there's such a thing exists. 15 minutes. Go take a break. Let me cover your assignment. Let me cover your staff. Talked about huddle. Are we using huddle to talk about what's working well? Connecting to why? Where are we going? Where are we growing? Where are people finding their purpose, their rest, their restoration, their why? For number seven, it's about, as we're walking through these steps, it's about asking questions and taking action. You don't have to wait for the engagement data survey to come out, come out or the Glint survey data to come out. Be asking your staff. It goes back to what Kathleen asked earlier. She asked you personally to be looking at what do I want to start, stop, and continue doing. That's the, some of the things that we want you to ask your staff. What are the things I'm doing that's working well? What's one thing I can do to better support you? Not, is there anything I can do to support you? Mm -mm. Ask, what is one thing? What's blocking you to be your very best, keeping you from being the best you can be? What are the parts of your work you love the most? Do you get everything you need for throughout the day? Do you have the tools, equipment, resources? Ask questions. Connect with your staff. Gauge how they're feeling. Gauge how you can help meet and support their needs. I love that one too. And then the closing of that, right, is follow up with them. If they oh, ask yeah. you something, make sure you take action or follow up. Again, the, the difference between those organizations with higher engagement, especially yeah. about retention or uh, the vacancies, were those that had a consistent message that kept we're getting back to here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. So that's important. So we're back to you the, and mindfulness. And um, I started off with, and I mentioned it earlier about drawing on your emotional intelligence to handle the spicy or dicey situations we come into, into each day. And for you to take some ideas we've shared, I want to do just a two minute commercial on mindfulness to remind you that mindfulness is really, it's a skill. It's a, it's a state of mind. It's about choosing to be present. It's about recognizing what's happening around you without judgment. And then it's making a decision to be purposeful. And it's really, there's so much research about people who are mindful, frankly, live longer, are happier um, and healthier. And so there's a lot to be said for all of us. So perhaps when we're arriving at work or you get up in the morning, can I think differently about my purpose and mission and look for how I'm fulfilling it? And at the end of the day, driving home, take those moments, driving in, driving out, how am I going to be today? Where will I see what I'm looking for and reflect on that when I'm leaving? When I'm entering a patient room, can I choose to be present in my mind, body, and spirit to that patient? What about when giving or receiving a report or when I'm sitting next to somebody in a department leadership meeting? Can I take time to look at my coworker? How are you? How are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? And this one, you know, we found out this a lot, and I'm sure we've all experienced it with COVID and the lack of... Um, visitors and stuff in our ICUs, especially in critical care, 
Um, our patients love it that when we, if we can FaceTime them and ask them to tell us about this patient, tell me about this loved one. What is she known for? What's a nickname? What did they love to eat? So that we can be present and mindful and talk to those patients. Um, even though we may not, you know, they may not be able to respond. Those are really important things that not only help us individually as people caring for others, but help those families. And so what about else can we do to take care of self-care practices, Katrina? Oh my gosh. In light of mindfulness, don't forget some of these things and don't laugh as we go through them. Sleep. We need our rest. That's part of our restoration. Treat that time as sacred. Exercise. How are you getting out? Moving your body. What are you taking in when it comes to nutrition? Please lean into the emotions of crying, talking, grieving. That spiritual connection that there's something greater than ourselves rest, relax, breathe, that mindful focus. And as always, don't forget humor. So remember to look for your silver linings. Sometimes they might seem hard to find because of global pandemic, the great resignation, lack of staffing, everything we talked about. There's always silver linings. Find them, look for them, hang on to them, help your staff hold on to them as anchors in the midst of everything that's happening and keep your perspective, which Kathleen's going to talk to us about. Well, you mentioned it earlier on when you talked about, uh, we thought it was going to be two weeks. I remember I was with all my nursing friends down in Naples, Florida, and we all said, ah, by the summer, we'll be okay. It should be all right. We should be able to control it. So perspective is everything, right? We're struggling to see a future beyond COVID, having anxious and depressive thoughts like, oh my goodness, this is going to last forever. So what we have to do as leaders and help each other is think about what do you want to take with you? We all know there's been blessings and there's good things from this. And I just want to Reflect back on a writer, and I don't know if you've never read this book, go get it, because it's an excellent book. It's one of the few I actually give you the whole, the name and the thing. It's Viktor Frankl. And when we're reflecting on perspective and not having answers, or how long one thing might last, or those who have survived long hardships, tremendous loss of lives, family, friends, and having to reckon with a horrible, unfair situation, Viktor Frankl in this book has some books on some thoughts on how he and others in Auschwitz Um, And others younger and stronger than him died. And yet he and others not only survived, but they thrived. And what he found in his research, which he became famous for, is when he could picture himself teaching others about his experience, when he could share what he learned and what he observed, that search for meaning, that is what gave him the connection, the strength, the hope, the courage, and the desire. And this is a beautiful manifestation of this from the critical care nurses. One day, you, each and every one of you, will fill and tell the younger generation how you saved the world. Mm. It's so true. We've got to be always looking forward about what can we share, what have we learned, and what can we teach our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren? What will they know about you? Think about what your kids are going to be telling their kids about what my mom and dad did during this That's the kind of things that we want to, that will keep us moving forward. I told you in the beginning, I want you to get that mirror out. And this is John Dewey, one of the greatest educators in the United States and the country there. And I love this quote. We don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. So I need you to look in that mirror and think about what can I stop doing? What can I continue doing? What can I start doing today now that I've listened to this and I've heard this? And what can I share with others? And Katrina, take us home. Absolutely. Home sweet home. Here's our wish for you. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, (laughs) full shelves on the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, a Friday night out, that taste of communion, a routine checkup, that school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring the deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we've become more like the people we wanted to be. We were called to be what we hope to be. And may we stay that way better for each other because of the worst. Thanks, Katrina. I love that. Katie, you want to close this out? Sure. Thank you, Katrina and Kathleen for this 
refreshing, eye-opening, compelling conversation. And just, you know, in summary, as, as Kathleen said, the best leaders are the best learners. So thank you to two people I consider mentors, Kathleen Lineham and Katrina Coleman, and, and to each one of you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Healthcare Experience Matters. Healthcare Experience Matters is brought to you by the Healthcare Experience Foundation. To learn more, please visit healthcareexperience.org. That's healthcareexperience.org.